We're in a series, we started it last week, on transformed, being transformed. My father, uh, our pastor, his mission, his life message is Romans 12 to being transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, to be transformed, to be renewed. He's written a few books on it. In fact, uh, legend has it that my first word as a child was renew, okay? I was, I was one, and I got renew. Yeah, Tasha said it was tra- hers was transformed, and um, I think someone was saying it for her in the background still then. And um, renew. They've been talking about renewal for their whole life, and I even wrote this thought down. He said this last week, and just to recap, He said, transformation and renewal keep us alive and engaged with God. I was like, come on, somebody, that'll preach. Transformation and renewal keep us alive and engaged with God. Keeps us alive with God. It keeps us engaged with God. Keeps us connected to God. I think the church, I think we often confuse or mix what salvation and transformation is supposed to be. You see, salvation is a one-time moment. You confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart, you're saved. Boom, moment over, you're saved. Salvation, moment. Transformation, rest of your life. Transformation is a lifetime. Salvation is a moment. But we often try to switch the two. And we get resentful or frustrated or we feel like we're doing it wrong or like other people, it's easier for them. But for some reason, for us, we feel like when we're going through struggles, it should have already been worked out and we should already be transformed because we know God. And we switch it and we feel like the rest of our life, we try to earn our salvation or deserve our salvation or live up to our, have you ever, you know I'm talking about as a Christian, have you ever felt like guilty or you've tried to like earn your salvation, deserve to be saved, uh, do what what it takes to, to, to make Jesus love you or, you know, am I, am I talking to the right group today? I feel like I've been there before. Like I'm trying to earn it or deserve it, but salvation isn't earned or deserved or it's, it's a moment. I get saved and in a moment's time I'm saved. However, salva- uh, transformation, now that's a lifestyle and a lifetime, but so often we get frustrated in that lifetime. Like, oh, well, it's just easier for others. God just does it for others. He just, it just doesn't work for me or it's too hard for me or should be easier. You see, the word says to be transformed, not conformed, which is what our, do you guys get your bracelets, by the way, last week? You guys like these? If you didn't, stop by our info centers today and grab yourself a bracelet. Get yourself a sticker out there. If you let the magnet go by, go get that magnet again. Um, And then Mill Creek, last week y'all ran out of the necklaces at this service, so we got some up there. Anyone in here like not make it last week and hoping that we get some more of those necklaces around that we could give away? A few of you, some of you. I see some hands waving, you're like, it's this. Most of them have like the little leather. I switched mine with the little chain. Is this okay? You like that? We'll get some later. Here's what the Bible says to don't be conformed, but be transformed. You see, to be conformed comes natural. It's easy. It'll just happen. You will conform to what you're around. But to be transformed, you must engage. You can passively be conformed. You must, in, uh, on purpose, be transformed. You ever hung out with a friend and you start talking more like that friend? You know what I'm talking about? Like, that you have a friend that always says a certain word, and when you stop hanging out with them, you're like, I'm saying that same word a lot. Or they act a certain way, they talk a certain way. Uh, why? Because you adapt. You become more like what you're around. You conform, and it's not always a negative. Every time you see here the word conform, it's not like a bad thing, it's just what it is. It's just, it's a neutral thing. Depends on what you're conforming to, to define if it's good or bad. But you just adapt to what you're around. See, you will naturally conform, but to be transformed, you must engage. It's an on-purpose decision. You'll naturally conform to what you're around, but to be conformed, to be transformed, now that has to be engaged. In Genesis 1.26, this is the start of our story. 
start of your story. This is the start of my story. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Let us make man and woman. Let us make you. He's talking about you right now. Let us make you in our image, God's saying, in, in his image. Your story starts with being created in the image of God. Now, if the image of God is here, and if your image is here, the difference between where you are currently and his image, that's the journey of transformation. That's what we need to be transformed to. You see, because God did not create a person with anger issues. He created a person in his image, and he doesn't have anger. You catch in this church. You see, he didn't create a person with addictions. He didn't create a person with fears. He did not create you to have those addictions that you have privately, secretly. That's not what you were created to have or to struggle with. He created you in his image. So the process of who you are today and who he is, the difference is the transformational process. Becoming more like him. Be looking more like him. Carrying his image and not the image of culture or maybe the image of your parents or the image of your nationality or your background or your whatever it is that you look a lot like. If it's not like God, we have a transformational process ahead of us. I love using my father or pastor as an example because it's, it's a clean, it's an easy one. But I'm, I can promise you that the kid that was 19 sentenced to two years of drug rehab was not the image of God in that moment. He did not look like God. He looked more like an addict. He looked more confused, fearful, and lost. Like That's what he looked like. But today when he leads us as our, as our pastor at 64, he looks more like the image of God today than he did at 19. You know what I'm talking about? It, I'm not saying that he's perfect. I'm not saying even that we're called to look like him. I'm saying that he today looks more like Jesus than he did at 19 because he's, he's engaged in the transformation process. And we also must engage in this transformation process. There was a story that I was reading about and uh, it's found in the, this book's called the, 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 the Girl with No Name, if you want to look it up. I said it first service. I said the story, and I, I forgot to say the book, and everyone, I guess, has been asking my wife, wait, what is he talking about? Girl with No Name. This, so grandma now, she's been married and has kids and even grandkids, but she shares in her story that years ago in South America, when she was around four years old, she was abducted by two men. She was taken, she was drugged, so she kind of passed in and out, doesn't fully remember uh, a lot of that timeline, would come and go, kind of come in in consciousness and out. And by the time she fully gained consciousness and she came to, she looks around and she was, in, she was deep in a forest with no one around. The men were gone uh, and she was just sitting there, alone, in, in a forest just scared to death, and she sat there, didn't move, didn't know what to do, thought someone might come for her, and she sat there for a day, and nothing happened, and a second day, and no one came, and side note, just simply the sounds of the forest would be terrifying to me. Like, I don't even like the sounds of the forest on my white noise machine at home. Like, I'm like, get out of here, up in here with that forest noise. Anyone use the forest noise on their white noise? Is anyone? That's scary to me. Like, I'm all like, give me the fan noise, the, the white noise, the brown noise. I'm a brown noise fan. I don't know why they're different colors, but they are apparently. Uh, maybe the beach, like we, we getting crazy, like the waves, but forest noise, get out of here. Scare me half to death in the middle of the night. I just wake up like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> what was that? What was that? Like, oh, it was my noise machine that I bought to put me to sleep. <clears throat> I digress. This poor, this girl, roughly four or five years old, in the forest, no one around, lost, abandoned. She's sitting there, as she said, the second, around the second day, this group of monkeys passed by her, kind of pushed her around and 
kind of hostile, but didn't hurt her. Didn't, she didn't die. Day goes by. Next day, same, same group she thinks comes by. This time they left some food on the ground. She grabs it, starts eating the fruit. And this happened for a few days. Days turned into a week. Week turned into weeks. And before she knew it, she was following these monkeys. As she started following to live, to eat, to survive, she wasn't created to act like a monkey or to be a monkey. She didn't look like a monkey. She wasn't one, but in that moment, she started following what was around her for survival. And in that pursuit, she started to conform. All of a sudden, she could climb trees better and figured out how to live and how to eat and how to sleep in trees. So to this day, as an older lady, she could still outclimb, she says, outclimb all of her grandkids up trees. <laughs> That's, I guess, a good part of the story. And she's just following this group. Those weeks that turned into months ended up turning into years where no one found her, no one came for her. She, she never was able to find her way out of this deep forest. She didn't know where to go until she'd lost all recollection of speaking, of her family, and she just lived in this forest. One day she's in a tree and she looks down on the floor of the forest and she sees something sparkling, something shiny. She crawls down and sees it, uh, uncovers it a little bit, and it's, it was bright and she jumps back, comes back to it, looks at it again, kind of gains courage as she keeps looking multiple times. So she finally picks it up and realizes that what she was holding was a mirror. And after all these years of following these monkeys and surviving like a monkey and living like a monkey, she was faced with the reality that she wasn't. That she was a girl. She didn't look like what she was following. She didn't look like how she was acting. She, she didn't resemble that what she assumed she was because she had lived following what she wasn't. Because the mirror revealed what her true reflection was. It was there that sparked her need to keep discovering and looking. And from there, she actually did escape the forest and clearly has been able to live to write about her story. But it was the realization that she didn't look like what she was following. It was the moment that said, wait a minute, I'm different. I don't look like these monkeys that I've been following. I don't look at all like them. How many of us have been acting like a culture that we were never created to look like? How many of us have been following a world, an image that we weren't created to reflect? In 2 Corinthians 3.18, they're going to throw the scripture up here. It says, but we, with, but we all with unveiled faces behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And they weren't ready for this. But I want to read the two verses above that. In 2 Corinthians 3.16, it says, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Go down now to 18. It says, For we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. So let me unpack this for us. In verse 16, it says, When you come to the Lord, when you confess Jesus, when you engage with Jesus, when you start your relationship with Jesus, the veil is removed. Go down to verse 18. It says, Now you with an unveiled face, which means you've been saved, are able to see God clearly, now you're being transformed into his image. It's almost as if it's saying that how you're called to look should be, should be like looking into a mirror when you see Jesus. You and Jesus should look so similar, it's as if you've looked into a mirror every time you see him. Are you following this, church? When you get saved... 
then you get to look at Jesus with an open face, with an unveiled face, and when you see Jesus, it should be like seeing a mirror, because that's what you're being transformed into. When you look at Jesus, does it look like a mirror today, or do you look more like your culture than your creator? Here, here's, a, here's some easy tests I'm gonna give us, and I'm talking to myself today too. Here's an easy test, men. Do you love your wife like Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her? Because that's what my Bible says. It, says. it says that Jesus loves the church and gave himself up for her to beautify her, to make her more holy and to wash her with the word. It says, husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church. So husbands, when you, when you come home from work, do you view your wife the way Jesus viewed the church where he said, I will sacrifice my life. I will give up whatever I can. I will give up to everything that I have. I will sacrifice who I am for my wife. Or are you more like culture? Like, no, nah, I'm the man in my house. Huh. <laughs> no, that's not how it works in my household. Okay. Monkey see, monkey do. Can we go there today, church? Can we, can we actually engage in a conversation about who we actually are looking more like? Can we actually talk about it? Can we go, wait, what is it that I actually, do I actually look more like culture or like Jesus? You see, Jesus says, men, love your wives as I loved the church. Well, what did Jesus do for us? He died for us. So the next time you say, well, I'm the man of the house. Great, as the man of the house, submit the most. Serve the most. Lead with grace and joy and kindness. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you just don't know what she's, what, what she's asking of me. I don't care because Jesus died. So until she asks that of you, you still haven't met your image. Because your reflection should look like Jesus, not like culture. Yeah, but you don't know how hard I work for our family. Well, Jesus worked pretty freaking hard. Here's another test. When you don't feel good, do you go to WebMD or the Word of God? Because you can look on WebMD for like four seconds and realize you have cancer. You can look in the Word of God for four seconds and realize you've already been healed. What is it that you go to? Because one is the answer that culture says, you better look into it, you better get the, the medicine and the prescription, you better mask that issue. Jesus says, I don't have to mask anything. Oh, I've already overcome the issue. I've already conquered the issue. I've already overcome any sickness and any disease. By his stripes, you are healed. So what is it that you're looking at? The word of God or the word on the web? Here's another one. This is going to be touchy, but we're just going to go there today. The Word of God says to pray for your leaders in authority on all positions. Are you more consumed with the impeachment or your prayer life? Oh, just get quiet now. Get quiet now, ladies. Yeah, you were amen to me when I was talking about your husbands. You're like, yeah, go there, preacher. Oh, you better not say that word again. Jesus prays for his leaders. That's what he said to do. He said, you pray for your leaders. You know that the leaders of that day crucified him and he still said to pray for them? See, so what is your reflection? Do you look like Jesus or do we look more like the culture around us? You see, because uh, to be conformed is natural. To be transformed takes engagement. Do you just look at Instagram all day long? Or when was the last time you actually opened your Bible app and read the Bible for seven days in a row? If you open your Bible up seven days in a row, you might think you hit revival and go start your own church. You're like, Jesus, I am so deep in the word of God. I've read the word for 18 minutes this week. I might start my own church, somebody. <laughs> Me and Darius Daniels got doctors together. <laughs> because it's such a foreign concept sometimes for us to actually engage in the word of God on a daily basis. But I'll just open Instagram on accident. Just open my phone. I'm just standing here. What, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, someone walked in. I'll, I'll. It was just so natural to social media for a second. It's so natural to open up the news app for a second. 
Why isn't it natural to open up your word for a second? We're all about knowing the recent music. We all got preferences on music. How many of us have playlists for worship? I got a, wor- I got a workout mix. When I hit that gym, oh, I know what gets me pumped up. Well, what gets your spirit pumped up? Do you know? Do you got a worship mix that says, when, I, when I'm in the dumps, I do not go to news. I don't go to social media. I don't go home and just get drunk. I turn my worship on because that is where I find my peace. That's where I find fulfillment. That's where I find hope. That's where my faith is renewed. That's where I've restored. I go to God. Do you know? Do you know what's in the mirror? Or is it just monkey see, monkey do? I'm just acting like what's around me. I'm talking like the people around me. Do you know, have you engaged with Jesus so you even know what his image looks like? Because the scripture says when the veil is removed, you connect with Jesus, the veil is removed. Verse 18, it says, now beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, being transformed into the very image of Jesus. You are called to look like Jesus. Will you ever get there? No. Will you be perfect? No. Should you be on the journey? Yes. How much further on this journey will you get in 2020 than you did in 2019? We're called to look like Jesus, church. Our marriages should look like Jesus. Our parenting should look like Jesus. The way we we start companies should look like Jesus. The way we lead employees should look like Jesus. The way we go to whatever it is that you you are engaged in, the way you're a student should look like Jesus. And one does not need to suffer for the other. You can be a godly boss and a godly husband and a godly parent, and you don't need to steal time from one to do the other correctly. God has enough time. He's got enough ability. He's got enough wisdom. You can succeed at what he's called you to succeed at church. You could be on the dream team. You could lead a life group. You could have a company, and you can have a great marriage, and it can all work if you're being transformed into his image. He created the universe in seven days. He can lead your life. He can work that out. He can figure it out. Oh, no, you just don't know how much it takes at work. Oh, you just don't know how bad our marriage is. Oh, you just don't know these kids. Oh, you just don't. No, God wants to enable you, equip you. He wants to give you the wisdom that you need to succeed at the life he created you to live. And looking more like culture is not going to help you. Looking more like Jesus will. Michelangelo, maybe one of the, maybe one of the greatest sculptures in the world, wrote, said these two, I love these quotes from him. When he was talking about the statue of David, which I chose not to share today because this looks awkward on these screens. <laughs> if you don't get it, just look it up. You'll figure it out. Uh, He said, I I just had to remove the pieces that weren't David. I love that. I said, remove the pieces that weren't David. I looked at a marble, a slab of marble, and I said, remove the pieces that weren't David. Another time he said, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. That's good. I saw an angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. Too often, too often when we come to God, we think it should be painless. It should be easy. It should be fast. And when pain shows up, we often run because we assume that the presence of pain means the absence of God. Does that make sense? We assume that the presence of pain must mean the absence of God. Oh, this isn't of God, it hurts too much. Okay. I mean, Jesus might disagree. 
The presence of pain does not mean the absence of God. You see, often in the transformation process, there's a chiseling process that's removing the pieces that aren't David. It's carving the statue until the true creation is revealed. You see, we started in Genesis, which says you were created in the likeness and the image of God. But he did not create a person with a drug addiction, with a pornography addiction. He did not create a person that needs to read novels to fulfill fantasies. He didn't create an angry person. He didn't create an abusive person. You see, so if you have those on you today, those weren't there when you were created. So when God shows up, he shows up with a chisel and he says, let's remove some of these pieces that aren't supposed to be on you because this isn't who you are. This isn't you. So I'm just taking the pieces off. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not here to damage you. I'm not here with a sledgehammer. I'm here with a chisel because I'm going to define you and refine you and I'm making you beautiful and I'm making you, I'm revealing the angel that's in the marble. But sometimes it means that a chisel has to be there. And often as Christians, we feel pain and we run. We say, God bless me. He goes, great. And then the next week, the preacher says, hey, I really want to encourage you this year to lean into tithing and seeing what God does in your life. You're like, oh, Jesus. Oh, whew, almost got, man. Thought he was talking to me there for a minute, but I dodged it. That was close. God's like, I mean, you were, you were praying for blessing. I need something to work with. Oh, God, I'm praying for more patience in my life. God's like, okay, here we go. You just get cut off like 38 times on the way to work and you just cuss every one of them out. And God's like, well, I guess we could, should, should, should work on language and patience. My like, God. Or you ask for wisdom. And then a problem comes up and you're like, oh my God, my life's always falling apart. Like, no, nah, God's like, you just asked for wisdom. So why would, why would I need to give you wisdom if you didn't want to apply it ever? Use wisdom to solve the problem. You see, pain shows up and we run. God, give me the marriage. Give me an anointed marriage. Give me a marriage from you. And then you get home and your wife's like, hey, I really want to talk about some, some of the struggles that I feel that you've been carrying privately. Oh, she's just always up in my business. <laughs> How are you going to get the marriage God wants you to have when you hide in all your porn addictions? How are you going to get the marriage you want, ladies, when you're feeling for fantasies in books and not with your husband, not conversations, not how come you want what God wants for you, but not willing to expose your heart to your spouse, your deepness, your real pains, your fears, the darkest parts of you, they're wanting to love as well. And if you're not willing to show that, how, how come, how will you ever have the marriage God wants you to have if you hide part of yourself. You see, when the scalpel shows up, it's not to hurt you. It's not to abandon you. It's not to abuse you. It's to love you. You say, God, I just need you more in my life. He's like, great. What if you woke up five minutes earlier than normal every day and just read my word? Oh my God, the first five, that's so important. Those last five minutes of sleep are really vital to my health. Oh, I would fall apart. You know, God, it's a, it's a, it, they get more important as the closer the time comes. You know, like the, the, when the clock goes off, those last few minutes are really important. Like, really? You can't wake up five minutes early to read your word? No, God, because the first seven hours are sort of important. Those last eight minutes of snooze, those changed my day. <laughs> my, okay, great. Well, let's find another time. You see, when... The chisel shows up and says, let's, let's carve out, let's just, let's delete those social media apps off of your phone just for a season unless you push into my word. Oh my gosh. Not to be a weird Christian. <laughs> okay, well. let's, just, let's just delete that secular music for a month and just push into my word. Oh, so now I can't be relevant to all my world today, Jesus? Okay. I didn't say you couldn't be relevant. I just asked for more time in worship. 
What if you chose to sponsor a child, a child through compassion, $30 a month, just to give above and beyond your tithe and care for one person and, oh, God, I'm already so tight. I'm already, someone else will take care of that. Okay. You see, when the chisel shows up, do our excuses show up? Do we run? God, I want your blessing. I just don't want to act like it. I want kingdom things. I just don't want to act like a kingdom person. I want your blessings, but I don't want to tithe. I want, I want your presence in my life, but I don't really want to worship. I want to listen to my music. I really want you to work in my life. I'm just not committed to memorizing your word because when sickness shows up, ibuprofen's faster than the word of God. Are we getting serious today? Because this transformation process isn't easy and it's not overnight, but it must be engaged. And the, the tool that God's trying to use is slowly removing the pains that you're carrying. No, 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 don't take that unforgiveness from me. That person wronged me. God never said that they didn't, but he cares more about you than the pain you're carrying. So let him take the pain and release that unforgiveness. They're not worth it. What they did was wrong. The fact that you're still carrying it is more wrong. Let that go and let the God that loves you and wants to nurture you and hold you and care for you, let him chisel that pain out of your heart. Those fears that are crippling, they go, I could never take a step. I could never do that. I could never lead a life group. I could never sing on the worship team. Even though privately, you sing like an angel. Uh, probably like, no, nah, I would never, just so embarrassed. I could, never, I could never take that step. I could never. Let God pull those callings and those giftings out of you because you were created to be a worshiper, not someone crippled by fears. So when the scalpel shows up, it's not to hurt you, it's to free you. What is it in your life that we're holding that's not us? That we won't release, but it's, you're a generous person. You're a giver. You love your children. Yeah, but I just, I don't know how to raise them because my dad did it this way and that's just how we do it. But lean into your other father and get training from him. I just don't like to share and well, open up, take a step of faith because that spouse of yours is there to love you the way Jesus loves you. Take that step and have the marriage that he wants you to have. Be the parent he's called you to be. Start the company that's in your heart. Be the leader of your life group the way God is calling and challenging you. Take that step of faith in the transformational process and allow those fears to be chiseled out of your life. Don't live a life and at the end of your life be more defined by the add-ons than who you were created to be. So what a tragedy if you lived your whole life and at the end of your life you looked at what you did and it had more to do with what you were afraid of, what you were hesitant of, than the person that God ultimately created you to be. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, the band can come right now. It's a preacher talk from trying to finish. You didn't like that? in this service. The last two services laughed at that moment. <laughs> Romans 12, too, I love this scripture. It says, in the message translation, it says, well, here's what I want you to do. I love verses that start with this because there's no, like, I don't have to, like, get my, like, lexicon out. I don't have to look it up in the Greek or the Hebrew. It's just like, here's what I want you to do. It's very simple. It's very straightforward for simple people like me. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you could do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Monkey see, monkey do. Stop acting like the monkeys around you. There's so many things that we just accept. That's what, that's what people say. That's what the smart people on the news are saying. That's what, um, that's what the blogger says. That's what the sports person says. We just accept so much 
that we're so naturally conformed to the world. But what I want us to really catch is the first part of the scripture says, here's what I want you to do. Take your everyday, your ordinary life, and place it before God. Here's the last point I want to share with you today. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down. Transformation will happen in your subtle submissions. Transformation, true transformation, heart change, heart transformation will happen in your subtle submissions. What does that mean? What does it look like? It means take your everyday, your ordinary life. So tomorrow when you're driving to work, give that drive to God. Say, God, I'm just gonna give you this drive. I'm not gonna turn on the radio. I'm not gonna turn on the audio book that I've been listening to. I'm not, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not gonna call that person. I'm just gonna turn on worship for the next seven or eight minutes. I'm gonna give you this time. I'm gonna give you my ordinary life. I'm gonna give you this moment, God. This is your moment. This is your five minutes. This is your 10 minutes. I'm gonna give you this time. I'm gonna turn on a podcast from a preacher that I've heard about. Someone, a friend recommended it. I'm just gonna listen to this for 30 minutes. I'm gonna give this time to God. It says, it's when you walk into your work tomorrow, you say, God, I'm gonna give you the first five minutes. I'm just gonna walk, I'm gonna give you the, what does that mean? I don't know, just give him the ordinary. Walk into your work and say, the first five minutes, God, is yours. I'm just gonna walk around and encourage people. Hey, it's gonna be a great day, praying for you, believing you. Man, I'm grateful that we work together. And then just go sit down and get, get back to your business. Give him the ordinary and see how he makes it extraordinary. God, today I'm going to give you my lunch break and just see if he doesn't just bring someone in your path and go, hey, let's get lunch today. I've been th- I have some questions I'd love to run by you. I'm like, oh, I knew God was going to do this. He put me on the spot. Yeah, because you gave it to him. You gave him your lunch break. He said, God, just use my lunch today. This week, I'm giving you my lunches. I'm just going to pray for 20 minutes. I'm going to worship for 20. I'm just going to read my word for 20 minutes. Tomorrow when you get home, give your family dinner to God and say, our family dinner, we're just going to sit together and talk about each other's day and just encourage each other. We're just going to give it to God. When you sit down at that dinner, look at your wife and say, I love you. Today I prayed for you. She might say, she might fall out of her chair. She might say, what did you pray? Like, oh, it wasn't very deep. It wasn't a Darius Daniels prayer. It was just, I pray for my wife. I'm thankful that she's mine. Might be time to go to bed. I'm not, I'm not sure. We'll see what happens in that moment. Y'all will get that later. It's simple, it's the everyday, the ordinary. Give it to God. It's not a revival moment, it's not a Sunday morning moment, it's not a stage moment, it's an in your car moment. And you keep giving those car rides to God and see how your life starts to look. You see, our pastor is 64 and it wasn't overnight that he all of a sudden was just this person. He started at 19 and the journey has been going ever since. There's a lot of car rides that he gave to God. There's a lot of conversations at the dinner table that he gave to God. There's a lot of pains that he gave to God. There's a lot of hard nights. I promise you he's lost more sleep than anyone I know because of the weight he carries, but he gave it to God. And he today stands more like Jesus than he was at 19. I'm not saying that your future is easy. I'm not saying that there's never going to be another battle. I'm not saying that you're never going to have a sickness or a disease. I'm just saying that when you get used to giving the car ride to God, then you'll know how to give the battle to God and the struggle to God, and the heartbreak to God, and the pain to God, and the anger to God. Because when you give him the ordinary, your life will become so much more extraordinary. God can take it, and one day you're gonna look back and go, I was transformed. I've been transformed. Because I learned to give him my simple submissions. You're gonna have a hard time giving God that cancer report if you can't give him five minutes in your drive. You're gonna have a hard time getting truly deep down to the, to the areas that you've never shared with anyone to your wife if you can't share it with God first. If you can't even say it out loud in a moment of prayer by yourself, I'm not sure how it's gonna come out to anyone else. You see, it's the simple submissions to God that say, God, you can have this three minutes these five minutes. You can have this drive. 
God, you can have this friendship. God, I know that I've been struggling with releasing this person, I give them to you. And it's in the simple submissions that true transformations come into your life. Come on, let's all close our eyes. Here at Federal Way, there at Mill Creek, if you're joining, if you're still watching online, be listening to this message later, let's all close our eyes right now. I wanna pray for anyone that hears my voice right now that doesn't know Jesus. If you've never connected with Jesus, if you've never started a relationship with Jesus, today is the day that will change your eternity. You don't have to do anything, you don't have to earn it, you don't have to deserve it. All you have to do is say, Jesus, come into my life and you forever will be changed. If you've never started a relationship with Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, before this moment, today's your day to start that relationship, to submit your life, to give it over to Him. Or maybe once in your life you had a relationship with Jesus, but between just the way you've lived and lifestyles, you've just slid away and you're saying today, I wanna recommit. I wanna start a new relationship with Jesus today. So if I could pray with you today to connect with Jesus for the first time or reconnect with him today, I'm not gonna make you stand up or say anything. I just wanna see who we're praying for today. So if I could pray for you today, would you just slip your hand in the air so I could see who we're praying for? That's awesome. Who else? Reach out, reach out. Come on, reach up. That's awesome. Oh my God, hands all around this room. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, Mill Creek, reach out. Come on, Mill Creek, reach out. Who else wants to say, add me to this moment of prayer. Add me to this prayer. Today is my day to connect with Jesus. Come on, reach up. Thank you, Jesus. You guys can put your hands down. I'm gonna say a prayer, and if you raised your hand, would you make this your prayer today? In the word, it says, those that confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus was raised from the dead will be saved. So today, this is your moment to confess and to simply believe. Jesus, thank you for coming to earth for me, for loving me so much that you died for my sins, for what I've done, for my wrong. Thank you, Jesus, that today I start a relationship with you that will redefine who I am and re-identify who I am. Thank you, Jesus, that you created me to look like you. And I start that journey today with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, can we celebrate this eternal moment? Come on, we can do better than that. Let's celebrate that eternity will look different today. Come on, so let's, let's all stand on our feet. We're gonna worship before we leave today. Mill Creek, we love you. Have fun up there worshiping.